Mr. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, first thing I've been asked to say is that you should start eating. Um, <laughs> this is what it's for, and uh, uh, everybody who is going to talk has uh, assured us that uh, they don't mind that you eat while they talk, and we'll try to catch up with you later. But before uh, talking about the topic at hand, and in the uh, language of Robert's parliamentary rules of order, I uh, would like to rise to a question of uh, personal privilege, if I may. I do this to uh, personally address one of the hosts of today's meetings and a good friend, Ambassador Phil Murphy. Beginning with a first conversation around Phil and Tammy Murphy's dinner table, in February of 2010, and Phil, the food was very good there. Um, uh, this is now the seventh, as we've heard, and as we've also heard, and very unfortunately the last time, that he and I have joined hands in bringing American and German experts on higher education together to compare notes and to exchange ideas on views issues of key importance to universities on both sides of the Atlantic. This remarkable series of conversations would not have been possible without Phil Murphy's sustained and passionate interest in the subject and without his support and encouragement. Through these meetings, as in so many other ways during his tenure in Berlin, Ambassador Murphy has raised the notion and the practice of cultural diplomacy to an entirely new level. And we are very much in his debt for his inspiration and generosity. The least we can do to honor this remarkable legacy is to make sure that this exchange continues and it's already been mentioned that it will. And whatever exciting things the future holds for you, Phil, we hope you will cherish the memory of these conversations and perhaps drop by from time to time to keep us on our toes. Warm thanks to you and Godspeed. Thank you. <clears throat> my task in my remaining time is to explain why, in planning this meeting, we have decided to deal not just with one kind of institution, but with two not only with the model of the undergraduate college and the role that the liberal arts can and do play in shaping its intellectual and curricular identity, but also with the model of the professional school and why talking about both at the same time makes eminently good sense in the current context of German higher education. My answer to this question is twofold. First, I will argue that both the liberal arts college and the professional school are not only particularly interesting inventions of American higher education, but also very promising models for rethinking the intellectual architecture of German universities. Karen Beck will later explain why this is so in the case of the liberal arts college and its possible variants. I will, in just a moment, explain why I think this is true for the professional school model as well. My second reason for why we are talking about these two institutions at the same time is that they have one particularly interesting thing in common. They both lend themselves, each in its own way, particularly well to dealing with a kind of issue that the contemporary university, American as well as German, is normally not very good at dealing with, and that is an intellectually robust and academically credible way of inquiry into questions of norms and values. I say this against the well-established observation, against the background of the very well-established observation that the development of the modern university has leaned very heavily 
and rather disproportionately, I would say, towards cognitive knowledge at the expense of both aesthetic and normative knowledge. Let me say just a few words on each of these two observations. I probably have to say less on why I think professional schools are an interesting way to organize, organize both research and teaching for certain kinds and areas of knowledge. Over the last few years, as some of you know, I have made a bit of a name for myself, and some would even say I made a bit of a nuisance of myself by arguing that German higher education can do a lot worse than looking at the professional school model as an interesting alternative for its internal structure. There's plenty to read on this on my website, and my efforts have not gone entirely unheeded. Just look at the new School of Education at the Technical University of Munich and at the recommendations of the recent group of experts on teacher education in the state of Baden-Württemberg. In brief, the argument goes like this. There are fields of human pursuits whose knowledge needs are rather poorly served by traditional discipline-based university faculties or departments. Education is such a field as it has to rely on the insights of psychologists, sociologists, neuroscientists, economists, anthropologists, and quite a few others in order to adequately understand what is going on in schools and universities. The same is true for business, for public health, for engineering, for law, and indeed for public policy, which is why we are here today at a professional school of governance. Professional schools, in other words, provide an institutional arrangement and an academic culture for generating and disseminating knowledge that is both interdisciplinary and applied, and that provides a particular professional affinity with the domains of social life that they serve. Schools of education with the world of teaching and learning, business schools with the corporate world, and schools of governance with the world of public policy. Professional schools have a long and on the whole distinguished history in American higher education. Silicon Valley would be unthinkable without the symbiotic role of both the School of Engineering and the Business School at Stanford. As I've mentioned, there is some initial experimenting with the model going on in Germany. Let me now turn to my second argument about why it makes sense to talk about liberal arts colleges and professional schools at the same meeting. My argument was, as you may recall, that both liberal arts colleges and professional schools have a particular, if different, propensity for the scholarly pursuit of normative issues. We will hear more later about how the tradition of the liberal arts colleges deal with normative issues, but I, for one, have always been impressed by how creatively and congenially that tradition in its finer specimens, such as Bard College, connects the insights of history and the rich human narratives of our great literatures with an understanding of such value-laden issues as conflict, trust, competition, or indeed truth. Professional schools similarly, and by the very nature of their mandate, can hardly escape a normative discourse either. Their closer proximity to the realities of social, economic, and political life exposes them much more directly to the normative conflicts inherent in that reality than is the case for an academic department of, say, physics, psychology, or English. Let me take the two cases in point with which I am most familiar. 
The first is a professional school of education, with one of which I've been associated ever since I started teaching at Stanford 48 years ago. In a field like education, it is hard to imagine a pertinent research or teaching agenda that would be oblivious to such normatively charged issues as equality, achievement, competition, or indeed knowledge. Not to mention the value questions involved in curricular decisions. Just think of the bitter fights that are still being waged in my country over creationism versus evolution or about how to teach the Civil War. Professional schools of education simply cannot escape from these issues. Moreover, it is part of their professional and academic mandate to assure disciplined inquiry into the nature, origins, and variations of the many normative orientations that define the educational exercise. My second case in point takes us right into the halls of this distinguished institution whose guests we are tonight. Because it is the field of public policy where the professional school model has also served quite congenially at the interface of scholarship and the world of power. And that is true not only of the Hefty School, but also of such places as the Kennedy School at Harvard, the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, or the London School of economics. Here again, we find a special propensity for dealing with the ubiquitous normative issues that permeate the world of policy, where issues of choice, of values, of priorities, and ethics play such a key role. Most of the major policy controversies that have recently loomed so large in American as well as German politics have profound normative connotations from Obamacare, gun control, and immigration in the US to the future of hearts for homosexual marriages and women's quotas in Germany. It is one of the great challenges for a professional school of public policy to understand and to teach how the normative arguments surrounding each of these issues are to be analyzed, weighed, and mediated. What is true for education and public policy is true for other fields of professional pursuit as well, such as public health, business, or law. For each of these areas, the capacity for reasoned discourse on normative questions lies at the very heart of the concept of professional schools. Let me conclude by returning to the parallel perspective on liberal arts colleges and professional schools, and here especially professional schools of public policy. There is a complementarity here that I would like to underscore. The efforts of schools of public policy to understand and promote good governance depend for their success very much on the work of our schools and universities at large to promote in its broadest sense, good citizenship. It is no coincidence that the recent literature on the future of the liberal arts in the United States, Nussbaum, Del Banco, and others, is heavily oriented to the critical function of citizenship in modern democracies. It is this close relationship between good governance and good citizenship that makes the connection between liberal arts colleges and professional schools such a fascinating and important issue. Ladies and gentlemen, I now have the honor to yield the floor to one of the most distinguished and experienced leaders of an American institution of higher education, Leon Botstein, the president of Bard College, an institution that represents the liberal arts tradition in the United States very much at its finest. To understand Leon Botstein and how he has shaped Bard College, it is also important to know that he has, for many years, been the celebrated conductor of one of the most important New York 
symphony orchestras, the American Symphony Orchestra. Leon Botstein will be followed by Dr. Karen Beck, a literary scholar with a special interest in Slavic literature who has played and continues to play a major role in the Leuphana version of a liberal arts program at the University of Lüneburg. Leon, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you don't mind a little a dissenting voice in such a um, civilized gathering, um, I, I want to say to um, my previous speakers, I want to thank the hosts for this, uh, Ambassador Murphy. Um, we don't always uh, have pride in our ambassadors, but uh, you are among the best we've ever sent. And. Um, And you doubtless you know that famous joke since you quoted Kennedy and Jefferson. There was a famous joke when Kennedy hosted the, this big dinner that Jackie put together of all the famous uh, uh, Nobel Prize winners and artists. I think Casals was there, and he's reputed to have said, this is the most impressive mental assemblage, something to, the, to that order, uh, to have had dinner in the White House since Thomas Jefferson ate alone. <laughs> Um, and to my colleague, Thomas Rommel, who is quoting Shakespeare, you know about the, the ideal teaching circumstance. I'm always amazed. In the United States, there's a movement against schooling. It's called homeschooling. And it was really started for sectarian and um, anti-integration anti reasons and hostility to the presumed secular humanism of the American school. And we actually take a lot of homeschooled kids and... Uh, people ask me, what do I think of homeschooling? And I said, homeschooling is the oldest idea in the universe. Felix Mendelssohn here in Berlin was homeschooled. Now, clearly by Heise and others, it, it's a homeschooling few of us could afford. But um, one forgets that uh, school, as we know it, may be an unfortunate necessity, not actually the ideal circumstance of learning. And to Hans Weiler, my distinguished colleague, as a long-standing critic of American schools of education, um, whose abolition I have long advocated in order to try to promote the quality of American schooling, um, I, I, while I respect the possibility of a professional school in education, uh, I've yet to find one with which I'm comfortable, in contradistinction, for example, to public health or to medicine. In the United States particularly, the professionalization of education has had, in my view, a cumulative deleterious effect on the quality of elementary and secondary schooling, largely because it produces people who may know how to manage a classroom but have nothing to say. and. Um, uh, don't understand the subject matter. So we have the opposite problem. We've gone too far, in my view, in, um, in relying on schools of education to produce the teaching professionals of the country. Let me also say with a general dissent, um, we talk about citizenship and education, and liberal arts particularly, and that's a theme that uh, is very much part of the American system, but actually the truth is it is rhetorical. We have not achieved it. The United States has more people who've gone to college than ever before and it has the lowest level of political discourse in its history. In fact, what is most troublesome is our failure in the United States to actually realize the rhetoric of the liberal arts. Despite Del Banco and Nussbaum and Dewey, the reality is what goes on in the American college um, is um, not what it should be. That doesn't take away from the idea. So one has to distinguish the, the ideology of the programs and their actual functioning. So let me turn for a moment, not in defense of the actual functioning, but from what my point of view is, uh, what the reform of liberal education or liberal learning might look like. The premise precisely is what this gathering is about. The presumption that with the right education at a crucial age of young adulthood, you would create the intellectual and ethical qualities uh, that would make for great citizenship. 
And the presumption there is that um, there's talk of the normative discussion of understanding normative questions. So I'm going to divide that in two parts. One is we'll call the curricular part, and the other is the experience of being a university student. On the curricular part, uh, most of the um, emphasis is on what we call general education. Education that all students participate in, irrespective of their career ambitions. So the future lawyer, investment banker, they go through a process which presumably is um, based on a set of problems and issues in order to develop skills which are transferable from one discipline to the other or useful in some general way, and this is where the citizenship comes in, useful in the conduct of participation in public life. And those are historical ways of thinking about history. They're philosophical, and that's where the normative questions come in. Aesthetic, in my view, not all universities believe that. And epistemological, focused really on the questions of science. In my view, for example, no citizen in the 21st century can be as scientifically illiterate as the average graduates of our Ivy League universities in America who do not graduate in a scientific discipline. It's impossible to deal with questions of environment, health, um, for example, um, or questions of public policy without a scientific literacy which is sufficient to understand what the issues are. So these four areas, which are the primary areas of a general education program, um, are supposedly to cultivate habits of mind and the use of language in a way that makes the individual citizen articulate, both as a reader, observer, and as a writer, especially with blogospheres and the current social networks, that the ability to express opinions. The problem, however, is that we are at a time where the ability to tolerate reasoned debate is at a low point, and where the rise of religion and the belief in claims of truth that are not to be reasoned with is at a high point. The paradoxical reality is that we in the university do not pay enough attention to the uncomfortable reality that a true believer in normative values will not accept skepticism and doubt and may not tolerate a different result to an ethical question. And the authority of the inability to tolerate the other person's different result is based on authority which is not within the university and is not bounded by issues of rules of evidence or reasoned debate, all that rhetoric falls on increasingly deaf ears. And the certainty and the plausibility of certain kinds of normative claims, uh, uh, is, is, these are growing factors. And our inability to, um, to have a good answer uh, to the question that um, a skeptical mind may be one that has no values or no principles the unprincipled technocrat. So I think we have to think carefully about how we do this. What is quite clear is that it needs to be done. In our circumstance, one of the reasons it needs to be done is because the quality of our secondary education is so poor. So young people in the United States come to college inadequately prepared. Now the European system has always prided itself in a much more superior secondary system. Whether that is still the case is an open question, and whether in a democratic culture, if there is a common school and common access to the university, whether the, the student is sufficiently prepared to actually make a decision to enter a disciplinary course of study without actually going through a program of general education, where there is a curriculum based not on disciplines, but on issues, and where there has a multidisciplinary character. The truth is specialized knowledge, detail is crucial, but specialized information is not necessarily organized by the academic and intellectual and bureaucratic rubrics of the university. So in our case, this prior preparation is a crucial um, intellectual journey prior to the students making a decision what field he or she will go into. Furthermore, the students we now have will live forever. 
with artificial limbs, <laughs> artificial brains, and this long life, which is actually a curse, uh, makes the issue of ad adaptation and multiple careers much more likely. So why is anybody in a hurry to produce the engineer or the scientist or the doctor quickly? There are certain things to be learned young, and there's nothing against that. But it is very important to remember that um, the liberal arts offer the opportunity to, um, uh, to season the career decision and also change, and this is where the professional schools come in, change the set of questions that are raised later on in professional training. When a person becomes a physician, if they actually have thought about issues that have to do with life and death, with philosophical issues that have to do with ethics, uh, that's a crucial matter. Someone who's making a public policy decision or ends up in law um, needs really to uh, have thought carefully about ways of thinking about justice. So John Rawls is not part of the law school curriculum, but having read John Rawls or Plato or Kant, um, is no loss to the person who then seeks to think about the conduct of one's life as a lawyer. Let me turn last to the question of the original model of the American University, which was not totally one of classroom education. The connection between democracy and education in the American liberal arts undergraduate context was always one of the common dining, common living, and connection of the community of students to its external community. That is to say, in your alma mater, Phil, Philip Brooks House, for example, uh, is a good example. This is a, an outreach program, very traditional at Harvard. Uh, that's a very small part of the Harvard undergraduate experience. But the Harvard undergraduate would say 90% of her or his experience was the crimson the Harvard Radcliffe Orchestra, um, uh, Phillips Brooks House, the things that undergraduates did together that were outside the curriculum, the connection of learning and life. The university is very comfortable in segmenting its operations from the content of daily life. Where do you learn how to conduct your daily life as a citizen differently than you will when you live in an apartment or a house in a city or in the country or in a village? This is taught nominally, it should be taught, um, in the context of living in a common space, especially if the university draws from not a region, but a national student body, and one's floor mates and roommates are in different fields. So one's roommate is an artist or a future engineer. But the task that the American College has failed in is actually to mobilize real activity in life outside of sports. America excels in the use of its undergraduate colleges as a very inexpensive way to provide the American public with semi-professional and professional sports entertainment. So we think of Duke University, not as a great university, which it is, but a place of basketball victory and sex scandals having to do with the misbehavior of the athletes. So we do not have a Greek version of participatory sports, but a gladiatorial version. And therefore, our association with the university is not for its intellectual greatness, but for the winning team of which we are not a participant. This is idiotic, if not ironic. But it is the only way American state universities convince their legislatures to fund them. <laughs> As a very famous president of the University of Wisconsin said to the legislature in a hearing, don't you want a university of which the football team can be proud? <laughs> so the point being that our task in the United States is to connect the intellectual character of what we teach in the classroom with the conduct of life. The most important, and this connects to the public policy question, to service. Young people who are out in the world in our case, we have a program, we have 300 undergraduates who are prisoners, convicted felons. We run model public schools. We have programs in health, whether it be for battered women 
or for impoverished a clinic, impoverished clinics for impoverished people, working with children in the schools where in the United States there's no arts education, where in fact young people teach music to children where there is no other opportunity. Whereas part of their daily life as students is participating in the community and using the very skills, can be simple as tutoring, the skills that they learn whether they're future engineers, future physicists, in order to improve the life of the citizens around them. So one of the important things to consider is how a university community and its students can actually connect the curricular experience with the daily life experience. So I would say, finally, to close, that uh, in the connection to the professional schools and the idea of the liberal arts. I am a real believer that there is a connection between education and democracy, and that the citizen needs to be one who is inspired by his or her education to be active in political life, in public life, to have fearlessness about expressing opinions, about learning how to agree and to disagree, how to learn to change one's mind. If there were only a presidential candidate who doing a real debate as opposed to some kind of you know, uh, engineered uh, you know, sh um, contest on television, actually said in a debate, you know that, I never thought of that. <laughs> you might be right. <laughs> to ability to change one's mind, to actually be open to evidence, so in order to cultivate those habits of participation and to think how one's own profession or one's own interests can contribute to the quality of public life, um, there is a Im deeply important uh, need for a liberal arts general education. I would be cautious about the discussion of inculcating normative values. Um, I would be very acute about hearing how we can persuade people that you can be an ethical and good citizen without, for example, believing in a divine power or in any, any religious um, doctrine of any kind, to be an agnostic, for example. In my own field in music, uh, we have fought against the segregation of professional schools in music because in our field, music is a social art. And if the musician of the future does not know her audience, her public, and does not find new ways of connecting music as a form of life to the potential public, their own capacity to make music will be shortchanged. That music is not an athletic enterprise any more than being a physician is. The surgeon who operates on you simply as a task to cure a disease and doesn't treat the patient is not a great physician. You can cure the disease and ruin the patient. And how do you think about those questions? And that's what we try to teach. But do not mistake, as the nominal representative of the American liberal arts colleges, we have a long way to go to redeem the rhetorical promise that we think is the right way. So that's where the European-American cooperation is most important because we don't know what we're doing entirely. We both have traditions which have good and bad parts, and it's the way we formulate them in the future that we have any hope that we will fulfill the promise that's in the rhetoric. Thank you. Perspectives at the end of the talk of Professor Watstein, I would like to go back to being optimistic about the liberal arts. In the 21st century, when information, news, and opinions at any are present at any time and at any place through the internet and through media. A liberal arts education, in my opinion, seems to be more up to date and necessary than ever. This overabundance of information can lead to what I would like to call a banality of knowledge. When knowing something means that it is just a mouse click away and you just have to check it out on Google. The teaching role of a university in this context is less the transfer of knowledge than the support in the search for knowledge and true understanding. 
As David Foster Wallace put it in a commencement address a couple of years ago, now published under the title, This is Water, a liberal arts education is liberating because it gives you the freedom to decide, the freedom to decide how to, de to, how to react to the world around you. This inner freedom is an essential foundation for a civil society and its citizens, but it is most importantly essential for the person. My colleague Andreas Jürgens summarized the goal of our first semester liberal arts education with the terms irritation, reflection, and production. This triad brings the path to knowledge and understanding to a point. Through the encounter with something new and unexpected, we are irritated, and our traditional ways of thinking are challenged. Then we reflect on our old approach, think it through, and finally, hopefully, produce new insights, which, in the ideal case, we share with our fellow students or fellow citizens in order to continue the process of irritation, reflection, and production. When having a closer look at the three colleges in Germany presented here today, I saw this process at work in all our approaches. And I think it is a process that is still rather important in the more specialized education in professional schools, as it forces the student to step outside of his, his or her routine and reflect on his or her own approaches to the discipline. ECLA, UCF and Leuphana College are three institutions of liberal arts education in Germany and the variety of, of our approaches may serve today as a basis for the discussion of the role of the liberal arts in professional schools as well. As well. There is more than one way to do it. While the three colleges share a common goal and common values, they have chosen different ways to put them in action. Ekla of Bard is, a bit exaggerated, an American college in Germany. Or maybe even better, an American college in Europe, which happens to be in Germany. It is in the best way a pure liberal arts college, focusing on questions of the origin and development of our society's values and culture. To quote from the website, Ekla of Bard programs and courses are based on the awareness that fundamental problems in human society excuse me, in human history, the question of how to build a better society, the issue of aims and uses of scientific research, the function of art in its future, have recurred in a variety of forms and contexts and involve all areas of intellectual and creative endeavor. An awareness of the history of problems and the necessity of in-depth research and analysis combined with creativity for the solution of today's issues are at heart of the program. ECLA is a highly international school, both in its faculty and its students. It takes perfect advantage of its location and its own origin, using, so to say, an American approach to the study of the history and culture of Europe and especially Germany. UCF, the University College of Freiburg, is still another relatively small and focused institution that combines the American liberal arts tradition with the tradition of the German university. In a way, taking the opposite approach to ECLAS, but coming to similar results. UCF comes out of the Humboldt tradition of the unity of research and teaching that Professor Rommel has quoted earlier, and the development of the autonomous individual as the goal of university education. Its program consists of a core, electives, and a major. The core program is a rather rigorous one, with foundation, epistemology, and responsibility as of, and leadership building upon each other. The emphasis on the philosophical approach to epistemology as the basis of leadership is, in my humble opinion, a great merger of the German university tradition and the concept of the liberal arts, as it has developed in the US over the last century. It keeps the tradition of, a rig of rigorous questioning and analytical thinking of the German Wissenschaften and applies it as the foundation for the search for solutions to today's burning problems. All majors at UCF are interdisciplinary and society-oriented. Like ECLA, 
UCF is a small institution that can therefore focus on the development of its curriculum and thus on its students, but it's an institution that is starting and that we hope will grow. Leuphana College, my home institution, took a different approach. Closer to the model of a traditional American undergraduate college, we combine a disciplinary education, we com even a vocational one, with a liberal arts education for all our students. Half of our students choose majors and have chosen them before they enter the college in the area of business and economy. The others study cultural sciences or environmental sciences. All of these students, however, complete a common liberal arts first semester with modules that range from, the responsib from responsibility, a problem-based approach, problem approach, to history, the more fundamental humanities approach to the study of the world. They are, in the first semester and all consecutive semesters, always exposed to interdisciplinary approaches and work together across their majors. If we look at the buildings of the three that the three institutions inhabit in Germany, we can see that we have a, a great symbolic value. The University College of Freiburg, as I admit I just found out, is situated in a traditional building of Freiburg University, a building which used to be a Jesuit school. It is thus truly building on an old tradition, but developing it in a new way of liberal thinking and liberal training. ECLA is turning the former Ständige Vertretung der Bundesrepublik in der DDR, probably the most impressive symbol of the Cold War, into a place for international education. Leuphana itself is located in a former army camp that was actually founded in the early 30s. The pen, as we see in all these three cases, is mightier than the sword. What all our institutions share, I think, is the desire to instill in students a curiosity that goes beyond the traditional and the sense that the road to real knowledge and understanding is always hard, sometimes rocky, and it has no shortcuts. That is, however, that it is, however, a road that is most rewarding to take. In the, you have quoted Shakespeare, I go all the way back to Homer. If we look at the Odyssey, it is the journey to rocky Ithaca. Once Odysseus has made his strenuous journey there, Odysseus has to work hard to really come home to his own household on Ithaca. Maybe the journey is the task of colleges. The work at home is the task of professional schools. Thank you.